Hey everyone, welcome to episode 47 of the Sam Taylor Podcast. My name is Vishu Hanna and I'm the guest producer for this episode. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce myself as I am a new face to all of you. I am an international student from New Delhi, India and I just finished my first year in the Batch of Commerce Co-op program at DAL. During this year, I met Sam through her introductory accounting class and also decided to pursue an accounting major along with the Comsam minor and then go on to pursue a CPA designation. On the other hand, I work as an accounts payable assistant and as a tutor at DAL. Now back to this week's episode where Sam welcomed a fellow professor, a friend and the acting director of the MDI program at DAL, Dr. Colin Conrad. Although Dr. Conrad did his master's in e-commerce and PhD in interdisciplinary studies from DAL, before switching fields, he initially started out as a philosophy major from DAL, who later on went to pursue a master's in philosophy from Queen's University. Nowadays, he primarily researches how different groups of people use IT using EEG and eye tracking and is a part of a very niche group of researchers to do so. In this episode, Sam and Dr. Conrad discuss his research, the impact of social media, the formation of a new college at DAL and give their opinion on how to build experience. So if you're interested to hear a philosophy and information experts take on all of these topics, along with his definition of success, stay tuned till the very end. Spoiler alert, Dr. Conrad did recommend a book to the listeners, which is linked down below in the description, along with Sam's, Dr. Conrad's and my contact information. Thank you and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Welcome to the podcast, Colin Conrad. Hello. I almost said Colin Colin. That would have been interesting. Two like, first names. Yeah, first name two. for last name. Classic problem. <laughs> hey, um, it's interesting because I now have three first names, uh, but before I didn't. So it's uh, it's weird how things can change. I have an icebreaker question. Um, I don't know if you're going to like it, but I would like to know, are you a cat person or a dog person? I would say pretty firmly in the dog person right now. Okay. What do we do if your cat is listening to this later? She'd if understand. Java is like. She'd totally get it. Okay. <laughs> Java's not going to be upset. Okay. No. Why dog person? Yeah. We recently got a very large puppy. Um, the dog actually has a birthday coming up in about three days. And he's a. Uh, giant breed dog called a Leon Burger. So he's about 135 pounds right now, despite being just a year old. It's a year old. Your little baby is 135 pounds. I don't think many parents can say that about their babies in the first like, tw- you know, 15 years of life. Yeah. Uh, the groomers have a joke. They call him little puppy Argo. <laughs> like, oh, it's a little puppy. Do you know you started a trend? Um, uh, famous uh, musician Adam Levine uh, is now uh, a Leon Burger owner. Oh, interesting. Who's yeah. Adam Levine? Um, he, he's uh, he's a rocker. Um, oh my gosh, I'm gonna blank on the band that he's in, but he was also on, I believe, it was like The Voice, and um, yeah, he's like you know he's married to a Victoria's Secret um, model, have a couple babies, and now they have a Leon Burger. So, anyways. Uh, I'm going to see what you do next and then go see what uh, Adam Levine does. And if it's two for two, then we know that somebody is watching your Instagram very closely. I was going to say, I've heard of your podcast, but I've never heard of Adam Levine. So he can't be that famous. <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, this will this will go fabulous. Um, it was like I asked students a question a couple of weeks ago and it was an anonymous survey. And the first person that filled it out started talking like they answered the first two questions they're like I really like Samantha Taylor and it like and then it went over the top and so I pulled him up in class and I was like this person gets it this person is going places I'm like we will do whatever this person wants yeah get you into the top 50 in the (laughs) category of like education there you go on Spotify let's go love it love it thank you um okay so Colin I want to know a bit about your background uh and spoiler alert to everybody uh you know Give me a little bit of an introduction and what brought you to Dal? Because you are a Dal professor, but I want to I want to know a little bit more. Oh, wow. Okay. I, know. Um, I, know. I was born. No, <laughs> I was born in 1988. <laughs> uh, well, no, actually, I was born in Halifax, though. I think that's relevant here. Mm. So I actually did my undergrad at Dal, um, and my undergrad was in philosophy and economics. Uh, And so I did a master's degree in philosophy, 
And then realized that it's very hard to make money doing philosophy. And I mean, like, not just make a lot of money. I mean, like, make money, period. Mm. Uh, it's very, very difficult to get a job um, when you have a master's degree in philosophy. Um, eventually, like, I had a lot of different ideas back then. Um, and one of them was this idea of uh, having an app that can help you get off of Facebook. Uh, so my idea was that we have this big problem, and this was back in like 2013, where things like Facebook are really, really good at drawing in your attention and keeping you inside of them. Um, and so my idea was like, you'd have this app that can uh, convince you to get off of Facebook when it detects that you're getting sucked in. And it turned out that this idea was not a really good idea for a startup. Uh, so I pitched this idea, we won a competition, can't make a lot of money by making Facebook lose money. I, um, I was gonna say, <laughs> I, I feel like uh, <laughs> like it's an awesome idea, and like you were definitely ahead yeah. of your time. The business model is difficult, though. But we get back to philosophy, right? Like this is why you don't hire philosophers typically. Is like they're just gonna lose you money. No, <laughs> uh, but hey. it it was a really good. Uh, introduction to a research idea. So I came back to school, I was doing a master's at the time, and that master's turned into a PhD. Uh, and I got into neuroscience. Um, and so what I do today is I did some different research projects, I use this tool called EEG, electroencephalography, you basically look at your brain electricity, um, while you engage with information technologies of different types. And then, uh, you know, that turned into research and I started doing teaching. I started teaching in a program called the Master of E-Commerce. Uh, and by the time I finished my PhD, um, I ended up as a prof at Dell. Um, so I teach in the Bachelor of Management program. I teach at, um, in the Master of Digital Innovation, a few other programs, Master of Information uh, around campus. So that kind of brings us to where we met, because I remember being a new faculty, a teaching faculty who was starting to be research curious. And it was either in this meeting or perhaps in one like kind of before, but looking around faculty council uh, and like, okay, oh, like there's another like kind of youngish person. Uh, this is before a bunch of hirings. Um, and I'm like, oh, like, I wonder what he's into. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then I realized that you like teaching and you liked research and yeah, like coffees, talking about research. You were a guest, um, like a guest. You weren't the, you were the prof and my prof swap. Like you were just always game for different um, educational items. And I learned a lot kind of also speaking with you about uh, different teaching uh, interventions. And when I learned about your research about mind wandering, part of your PhD, mm -hmm. and that you were actually measuring um you know, students' brains when they were watching lectures, I thought that that was just fantastic because I was interested in cognitive engagement and you were literally not just asking the humans, you were asking their brain waves, like, and, and correlating the data. Um, and I thought that that was amazing. But what some people may or may not know and something that took me probably like a good couple of years of knowing you is like, how does somebody bring in computer science, philosophy, like, <laughs> um e-com like e-commerce like how does it all fit together and what does that phd look like and then i found the program that you were in um which is and again don't hate me um because i know that you are humble and that you'll hate me a little bit but then i realized just how exclusive the interdisciplinary phd was the id phd um and it's a program that you know, not only is it difficult sometimes to get into your PhD, but it was a specialized ID PhD where you have multiple supervisors in multiple like specific areas, and you're working to literally look at interdisciplinary problems. So, you know, computer science, neuroscience, uh, education, and, you know, perhaps like a management application. So that was really cool. And one thing that I love is if we wouldn't have like, if I wouldn't, we wouldn't talk during management uh, council or one of the research groups, um, I'm pretty sure that we would have met through my former TA and now colleague, Bryce Cross, because <laughs> he came across your research and was like, Samantha, you have to meet this prof. Like, I think <laughs> you guys could do some cool things together. So I feel like, you know, one way or another, uh, we would have got to know each other a little bit. Yeah, it's funny how I ran into Bryce as well, because like I do some consulting sometimes. I haven't done consulting in a little while, but back then I was doing some consulting with a startup. And I think that's how I met Bryce. Uh, it was just like through random 
random running into each other uh, during the uh, the consultant ring. Halifax is it's a big enough city, but it's small. Like yeah. it's it's small. You're probably going to run into people if you're going to run into people. Yeah, I think that's true. Okay. So I am interested then in learning a bit more about your discipline. Although what can, like, how would you, how do you introduce yourselves at conference, introduce yourself at conferences? Yeah, that's a good question. How do I introduce myself at conference? Which conference? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I would say at the end of the day, I am an information systems researcher. I study uh, how groups of people use information technologies. Uh, but the ways that I do that are a little bit different than other information systems researchers. And I'd also say the things that I'm most interested in are kind of uncommon in that community. Uh, so the techniques being different are, I, I like, you know, uh, look at people's brains, but also sometimes their eye tracking. Uh, mm. This is something new that I'm getting into, which isn't that common. I think that there are maybe 10 groups in the world that do EEG. And like neurotechnology is not that common in information systems. And the types of things that I'm interested in are primarily educational technology and social media. Uh, so educational technology, like, like the project that you mentioned for my PhD thesis, instead of getting sucked into Facebook, it was more like, how do you stay, keep your attention during long pre-recorded lectures? And this was before COVID. So I got super yeah. lucky in, in a way. At least one person did well with COVID. No, um, my research was suddenly relevant. Um, but Head also, of your time, a visionary. Yeah, well, pure dumb luck, really. Um, but also social media. Uh, I'm really interested in how people form early decisions in social media. Like how do you form early judgments and does that does that change um, the way that you're receptive to things like influencers and advice that people give on social media, things like this? Yeah, yeah, that's um, probably a talk for the next uh, Friday beers or whatever, but um, I'm in more and more kind of getting interested into the social media aspect and that parasocial relationships. So, and like, it's kind of evident to me anyways, when I see, interactions between say social media personalities and their like followers mm. for the first time and there's like an asymmetric uh familiarity mm -hmm. right um and sometimes like there's an acknowledgement of how awkward it is and somehow there isn't but it's observable so I, anyways my my research area may or may not touch on that in my second or third paper but it's um that parasocial relationship and you know, can we use it to, to build those social bonds? Is there kind of possibly a positive influence there? Um, is there any influence anyways, um, between perhaps like the emotions and uh, the effectiveness of teaching, which is the application I'm looking at? Um, but yeah, just influencers and what is an influencer? So anyways, I, I didn't quite realize, although I should have, that your topic was also looking into the social media. And it's really interesting to hear how yeah. how you started um, your research back yeah, one, in the day. One, so. one thing that's like super relevant, and I haven't pursued this topic yet, but one obvious application of the stuff we're working on is uh, financial advice, actually, on social mm. media. And personally, so? I'm really interested in how um, people can find a Instagram influencer or more likely a TikTok influencer who gives financial advice in mm. small bites. Maybe they're like, buy crypto or something like that. Why is it that you find that more trustworthy than, say, a teacher or a textbook? Um, why is it that we establish those sort of trust evaluations? And I haven't pursued this topic, but we've done similar things like with Instagram influencers, and I'd be interested in applying that to financial advice and as well sort of political belief formation. Ooh, ooh I like that. And Speaking of the influencers, I got to meet a very awesome human being um, that was a part of your research project and a part of her visiting scholar work. Um, and that was the project with uh, Annika, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the, a lot of the social media work was because I, I started with social media in my master's um, and that was like mining Twitter. In fact, my master's thesis was on uh, predicting political um, affiliations from from tweets, right? And this was before 2016. <laughs> so this is a trend. <laughs> uh, and then 2016 happened. And it's like, well, it turns out that 
we use social media to influence people. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm not doing any more of this research. I don't want anything to do with Donald Trump. You need <laughs> um, to tell us what you're working on right now, like right yeah. this second, so that we can go out and see which way the world is going to like... <laughs> In the next five years, yeah. Yeah, are you studying <laughs> volcanoes? <laughs> no, not volcanoes. Not volcanoes. Okay. Yeah, but but Annika, um, the Instagram influencer idea was was actually hers. And she came and really led this project and we, we built it out. So I, I really want to emphasize the fact that she is the first author on this. Like she's the idea person and does more work than I do on this one. Uh, but her idea was like, hey, on Instagram, there are these artificial influencers. They're not mm. real. Uh, so people like Lil Michaela, they're a robot and self-identifies as a robot, but there are probably also other influencers that aren't real too. You might not be able to tell in some cases. Um, how is it that, you know, 3 million people come to follow Lil Michaela, who's not an actual person? What is it that we find so interesting about her? And why is it that these influencers can actually start trends, can start um start um sort of new trends in, in the way that we buy things um, and so you know establishing trust relationships understanding those early uh sort of decision making in this case uncanniness it's this sort of feeling that something is awkward that something is off um is that a good predictor of whether or not somebody follows them on social media yeah that was a really fun um is it is it out there yet, or can we talk? Yeah, no, uh, the paper's been accepted in uh, ACM Chi, so we're going to Germany for Annika. You don't get to travel to anywhere exotic for her because she's from Germany, uh, <laughs> but we're going to Hamburg, which is just like a four-hour okay. train drive from where she lives, and I'm just like, this is great for me. This is so exotic. I've never been to Hamburg, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're going to present that paper in Chi, which is a really good... Um, yeah. Yeah. Human Computer Interaction Conference. So computer science bought it up. <laughs> That's really cool because I, I heard about Kai as a, as a non-computer science person uh, through a podcast that I listened to uh, from Cal Newport, who's a computer scientist out of Georgetown that has a podcast on, you know, culture, technology, uh, also just like deep work. Um, anyway, so that's that's interesting. That's, yeah, the world's collide. Congrats on that. And I'm, oh, I'm excited uh, to hear, yeah, just more about that because it was fun um kind of seeing the posters and seeing that process evolve as uh Annika was here uh last summer yeah no and and I, I think we're we're now because we're going to publish really and also a journal so we're expanding that study uh, but I also am starting to plan an additional study uh and I'm think I'm starting to think like there's a lot of room for that work on um in particular political influencers and deep fakes uh, I think that this is something that will be really, really relevant um, in Canada and in the United States, but I guess all over the world uh, really soon, because you can make chatbots that are very convincing now, uh, mm. and you can create deepfakes that seem real. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, because, like, when you said real, uh, like, I wrote down an uncanniness. I wrote down, what is real? Because, you know, there's even that, uh, like, one of my previous guests, um, you know, talked about... And she was on here talking about like financial advice. Um, she's uh, a banker and talking about personal finance. And like, now we're not just keeping up with the Joneses, like we're keeping up with the Kardashians. And then at <laughs> some point it's like, what is real? Like, what is that? Somebody's is that Kard a Kardashian who's using your money to buy stuff? Is it somebody that apparently there's jets that you can pose like pose in? Like they're, they're fake jets, but you would go and like do a photo shoot in them to like, let your influence, your followers think that you are flying in fake jets. Like what is real? So anyways, it's, it's interesting to see the, uh, computer, like, like the human computer interaction aspect. It's also just like fascinating for me to sit back and be like, huh, like, where are we evolving, devolving? Like what, like, where is this going and seeing how it affects different, different people, because and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know this from a science point of view, but I've heard that, you know, back in the day, our brains were wired where we used to our tribes of like two or 300 people. And now we have like a bazillion people and that must affect us in so many different ways. And it's just, it's fascinating, um, whether directly or indirectly or not at all tied to your research, just the different, the different problems that people face and the, really the application of research um, to improve people's day-to-day -day lives. 
Yeah, now you can see how philosophy is relevant. <laughs> Come full circle. You're like, this is, uh-huh. <laughs> well, there was even, um, we tried to put, I tried to put it in our paper. So uh, Colin, Philippe, and I have a paper that's going out. And um, I tried to put in a story about uh, Alinea or Alinea. And um, the person that was the finance financier that worked with Grant Smith, I'm forgetting his name, but anyways, he was a philosophy um, major before he went into finance and stock trading. So I will give you that. Philosophy <laughs> is everywhere. And with AI, it's becoming even more and more kind of front of mind and front of body. Yeah, I, I think as well, like one of the things that I find really interesting about social media is not just the downsides of social media, but how could you build this in a way that is actually good for human flourishing? Because there are a few few different ways that you can think of this. I think like an easy example is e-learning videos were very difficult for a lot of people during COVID, but for some people it was really good, such as people with ADHD. Um, being able to go back and rewatch a video for some people was really, really useful. And so I wonder sometimes how we could use that to um, to build better systems, build better information systems and information technologies that work for groups of people. And I think social media is a great example of this. There are people who use Mastodon because it's decentralized and they're trying to get this off the ground. I think it's missing a few features, but I think their heart is in the right place. Uh, you can, in theory, build something that is tailored towards not necessarily drawing people to uh, having great conversion rates on their clicks or to keep people sucked into the social media, but instead to get the information that they want and to build the relationships that they need uh, using the technologies. No, I like that. Like getting the dopamine hit from the right place versus the yeah. place yeah. that can be monetized. And importantly, like in in a, an amount of time that prevents yeah. you from, uh, prevents your brain from the trappings of, of long-term technology use. Yeah. Fair, fair. All right. So we talked a little bit before we started rolling and we were, um, maybe I won't ruin it. Um, I won't blow that. Um, what's one of your new roles that you're kind of pursuing and why might I be saying that management is not management without others, without interdisciplinarity? <laughs> yeah. So, so right now I'm, I'm, doing a six-month term as the uh, director of the Master of Digital Innovation here at Dell, but that, that's quickly coming to an end. Uh, and what I'm more focused on is this new college that we're trying to get off the ground called the College of Digital Transformation. And my theory is that, you know, um, Dalhousie in particular is a good place for doing interdisciplinary research, and there are a few others who agree. Um, I think by working closely with computer science, we can really build and cultivate expertise that we already have in this space around making processes better, making processes, yeah, more efficient, but also more human using information technology. So this mm -hmm. intersection between management and computer science is often seen as like digital transformation. This is something that we can be good at. Yeah, no, you, uh, not that I was needing to be sold, but I definitely was sold on the first like couple of sentences of the summary uh, that you provided in today's meeting, which is, yeah, um, collaborations, right? Better together. And we have we have people that are collaborating anyway. So how about we build a place in which we can centralize that and and kind of garner some strength and yeah, really position ourselves. Now, for somebody who might not know the inner workings of a university, how is it possible to have a college in a university? Asking for a friend. Oh, man. <laughs> so there, there's this really good author. Um, you know, he wrote these books called Discworld, and they, they have these uh, university professors, they're wizards, right? And <laughs> what's funny about them is you think wizards are these like arcane, perfect things, but they're always so dysfunctional. Like the university <laughs> is just like needlessly complex. <laughs> yeah. How do you have a college within a university? Because in the United States, don't you call university college? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, at Dalhousie, we call colleges the units that are responsible for both research and teaching mm. that are in between the things we call faculties. So we have, I think, 11 faculties, maybe 13. I can't remember. A number of faculties at Dalhousie that do these different domains. And we're in the faculty of management. And I mentioned the faculty of computer science, but we also have the faculty of law and arts and social sciences and science, et cetera. Um, medicine, faculty of medicine, that's where the doctors are. <laughs> um, 
but the colleges are designed to be you know cover those domains of research and teaching that are in between these sort of essential units so one example is the college of sustainability because mm. this incorporates many different things uh, it can be science it can be management right um, but also other domains like agriculture uh, likewise, we are going to propose a college of digital transformation to be that intersection between, yeah, management and computer science, but also other units that might have some interest in this as well, like law and medicine, because where do we need digital transformation no, most in Nova Scotia? Probably our hospitals, honestly, yeah. our medical yeah. system, yeah. and our legal system is, is a close second or third. Perfect. Okay, that, that makes, I think my friend will be happy with that explanation. Thank yeah. you. All right. So you're a prof, you're an IS expert. Um, my words, not, not yours. Um, <laughs> the main three main things of, uh, you know, being, being a prof uh, or profing is uh, teaching research and service. So what's the best and know that I'm going to follow this up with the worst, like what's the best part of your gig? <laughs> part of teaching part of service part of part of research and, no and it can't be that honestly um, like it, it doesn't need to be one bucket it can be an aspect or an element or a through line yeah sure i i'll, I'll say that there are three things uh eh, let's say two let's go with two i don't like service as much <laughs> um, but i do an awful you lot, do of, a it, lot so of it <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so the best thing about teaching that I really, really like, uh, I am particularly passionate about removing barriers to launching careers, actually, it's very mm. specific, like, I, I care about well rounded education people as well. But this one's kind of personal for me, because again, I mentioned at the beginning of this, like I was a philosopher who could literally not even get a job at Starbucks. Like mm. this, this was really upsetting to me. It's like I did so well in school, I pursued my dreams and my interests. And it's like, you can't even work at Starbucks. And I'm like, huh, this is a problem. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of have this personal thing where I am really passionate, not just about, you know, teaching and teaching innovation, but particularly about equipping people to launch great careers not even just like good ones like great ones and that is sort of my founding approach to my work with the master of digital innovation um, the other thing that i really like about my job is doing curiosity driven research so i can't think of any other place where i can do my weird brain thing in this context even if i worked at like a neuroscience institute they wouldn't be interested in the management context or if i worked at deloitte yeah, there's one, one center of neuroscience excellence in the world with Deloitte. And they're like the only company that does it. Uh, so. And even know. then, like, maybe it's your idea that you get to work on, but maybe it's not. And Probably. then it yeah. won't be your call, maybe. Yeah. Well, likewise, if I worked at Facebook, they do some of the stuff at Facebook, especially more on the eye tracking side. Uh, they care a lot about keeping people using Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because I didn't know you for super long, definitely don't know you as well as like, we know you, um, we, my husband and I uh, know you and Jenny, um, mm. your, your partner, hope you don't mind, um, can cut this out later if you're like, nah, no, no, you're good, you're good, personal stuff, my dog, okay. my cat, like, what are you People doing? No, no, Jenny, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like, um, but before like, um, Eric and I knew you and Jenny, uh, and before we had all meet our, each other's crazy dogs. Um, I remember taking on a project um, and there was, you know, some very low level digital transformation in there, um, but working with a black box and not just, I, I felt like some numbers weren't right. It was such a 10, like it was such a small part of the project, but so impactful to the learners. And I remember, you know, just finally getting a data dump, but, you know, our project is live, our teams are live, everybody's live. And I was in a pickle and I just messaged you on like LinkedIn, I think. And I said, Colin, I'm in a pickle um, and it has to do <laughs> some data. And I'm like, are you available for like to maybe help like with this project? Yeah. And what did you say? I said, yes. <laughs> you said yes. And you're like, I land at 10 p.m. Is that, a, can I call you then? And <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God, it's great. Yeah, that yeah, sounds you're like about right. flying in from Ottawa, I think, or Winnipeg. I forget you were, yeah. And oh, wow. we talked, <laughs> I sent you the data, I sent you the contract. You like, you turned it around so, so quickly and not only answered the questions um, that we were asking, but also answered the questions that I, I would love to know the answers to, but I didn't know how to ask the questions. Like it wasn't in my purview. And 
to me, that's what was such a great colleague, friend, consultant, is you answer the questions that using your expertise, the person would want to know the answers to. And you did it in a kind way. And like, that's it. That's what I, what I'm trying to do for my students is very parallel to like what you're trying, what you're doing for your students is like helping them find that path to not only survive, but thrive. And so like when we talk about and when candidates or students want to know about consulting and I was like, have the skills and don't be an asshole. And like <laughs> you, you blew both of those out of the water. And I'm just so, so grateful. Well, thank you. Yeah. I think like those types of projects, because again, like when I met Bryce, we were working with a, a company, which I, maybe I just won't disclose, yeah. uh, but we, um, you know, those types of projects where you want to engage university students and university stakeholders is kind of one of the founding visions I have for the college, actually. Uh, I think like we could be much better at collaborating with industry because we do have expertise here. Um, and I think our students benefit a lot by doing that. So I have like Absolutely. right now two students doing a side project with um, Transport Canada, Love um, it. which is kind of interesting. It's so interesting because like for that project that you came in on um, the first year, I needed to like just essentially get a grasp of it. And um, one of my students was having problems finding a co-op job because they wanted a special one so that they could go on the um, Israeli exchange. So I remember being like, huh, well, I think I might need a person for something, but I don't know what. And I know the skill set of like our Dal grads. So anyways, I hired him for the summer and it was like the the, he was the lowest paid person out of everybody and the, <laughs> and had one of the most significant direct impacts to like to a large number of spaces. And it's like, holy crap, like I was a believer in our students before, but like I am a like a, a client, like I am a like a first hand and it's amazing. So yeah, when I had the opportunity to do it again, I did. Um, I love collaborating with our undergrads, our master's students, specifically master's students in uh, the MI program, but I'm also looking forward to, you know, meeting a few from the MS as um, master. MDI. <laughs> The M no, uh, no, the MDI as well, but like, what's our other? Oh, the MSC our... business. Thank yeah. you, MSC business. Uh, now yeah, they're, they're interesting because they're thesis based, right? And, yeah. Um, I I think especially for the thesis based students, but but also like undergrads as well. Um, by doing those side jobs, they can create this sort of virtuous snowball, right? Um, because everyone knows, like, okay, when I read posts on social media, <laughs> which I am like, don't do it as much as you should, or as, as we all do. And then I go and do it. Um, but like people complain a lot about uh, needing work experience in order to get a job. Yeah. Well, this is actually one of the ways that you can create that snowball. It's not going to give you the best job after ever afterwards, but it makes the next thing easier and then Absolutely. the next thing easier. And so like doing those side jobs that are interesting, that give you really kind of convincing experience can be a great way to get started uh, with oh, a fantastic career. Completely, completely. Um, it's interesting, yeah. Like you don't have the experience, so I won't hire you, but you can't get experience until we hire you. So it's like, okay, great. How do you do it? Volunteer, uh, volunteer work is one, student work is another. No, volunteer when it's Volunteer not... can be good. Uh, Vol and yeah. But yeah, it start, start, it, that can be a good thing. Uh, yeah. But I, I also really encourage like for those side jobs, if we can find ways to pay the students. Oh, well. no, 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 completely. Yeah. I more mean, so like in, in CPA, yeah. sometimes you'll find where people want to go from a firm to industry, but industry yeah. is like, we want you to like be able to do the accounting, not yeah. just uh, audit. So yeah. I'm always telling my auditors, if you want to make the jump, go volunteer for a board because we're That's not right. talking about, Perfect. we're talking about professionals that are already yeah. in their career. Yeah. I, I agree with you. When we're talking about students, we yeah. shouldn't be building um, uh, like a sustainable like ecosystem off of the labor of like of unpaid students right yep. like that's that's not that's not appropriate in my opinion and it doesn't give the same self-efficacy it doesn't build the same uh work experience but it's a tool um yeah. in certain professional contexts when it's appropriate yeah and that so what i often do for unpaid things um i try to get those in courses when possible so like we have this collaboration with the Office of the Auditor General, so the Federal Office of the Auditor General, where the students won't get paid for that digital transformation, but it's part of their course requirements. And so they're going to work through that and we can do the learning outcomes Love through it. that project. And then ideally, you they go from that, yep. do a good job communicating on that to a side job I or a co-op, and then on to um, 
full full time work experience. No, I love it. It it just makes sense, right? If you're going to be learning it, you might as well be learning and helping. I agree. And strongly. then yeah, that virtuous cycle. No, I'm. I love it. Okay, you're not going to get away from this. What's the worst part of your your job, Colin? <laughs> and and feel free to name names. <laughs> yeah, no, e- easily paperwork. Um, yeah. without question that and grading, I don't like grading very much. I actually am a strong believer in giving good grades. I just don't like it. Uh, but I'd say paperwork is dead last and then grading is second last. Uh, the worst is when I have to figure out a process of how to like file a payment for somebody's scholarship. And it's just like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I will never have any idea what I'm doing. And I tried, I came back to school to get away from this because I used to be an admin assistant. I did some temping, right? That's the only job I could get instead of Starbucks. <laughs> They're like, you will let you temp, <laughs> enter data. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, no, I can do stuff with data. I'm not Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, yeah, that was one of the reasons why I accepted that job, by the way, was because it is an office job where I'm doing something with data. Fair. Um, which was yeah, a get, good move you, in hindsight. You get the line. Yeah, no, completely. It's interesting because um, I don't know when, like when the, the breakoff point is, but at some point it's like, you know, getting that first like wheel of momentum, that first flywheel um, is so important. So yeah, in, the, in hindsight, you're like, oh, that actually probably, you know, helped directly or indirectly, or at least it got like in the ecosystem. And if we're talking to people who are trying to figure out what's their first step on the rung, um, mm-hmm. you know, find it <laughs> and then and then make it work i guess well yeah i mean and i'll talk briefly about another example like yeah jenny who we mentioned in this podcast her first job was at blue ocean here in halifax and you know working at a call center doesn't sound glorious but through that she was able to learn a kind of complex mm. information technology and then apply for a cloud architecture job uh, that then became you know a more senior job at a more narrow firm Anyways, she's, you know, she's, she's, she's currently the professional services manager and a principal professional services um, engineer at a really interesting company based out of the United States. Uh, And it started with Blue Ocean, right? And she, it wasn't really her degree that got her that because her degree was like sociology and uh, English literature and German. She had a minor in German, (laughs) but yeah. It, it can, it is doable. Sometimes it's very hard to predict how your career will go oh but my gosh, if you're totally. entrepreneurial about those opportunities. Yeah. I mean, entrepreneurial and you can be entrepreneurial in a corporate mindset or in a, you know, like an organizational concept. Cause it's, you know, your entrepreneurship is your tools. It's your helping. It's how do I create more value than I cost? How can I solve mm-hmm. problems? How can I identify problems that are worthy to be solved? Um, and that no skill set is wasted. Honestly, I think one of my best ways that I developed a skill set was Red Lobster. Mm. Like um, going up and meeting new people and talking Mm -hmm. to them and being the initiator Mm -hmm. is something that I still find difficult like today. Um, But people would be maybe surprised to hear that. But I think it's because I had three years of like being like, hi, welcome to Red Lobster. (laughs) How's your night going? What brings you here? Like, what are we eating tonight? Ooh, do you want to pick this lobster? You know, just like getting in there and engaging and also reading people, like reading the ability. Like when you see somebody who has like the fuck off face, like you're, they're like, oh, we, we don't want to talk to you. It's like, okay, that's cool. Like, how can we like, get you what you need in the least amount of time possible. And I can go spend my attention like other places. So, you know, it's not the title. It's not necessarily the money. Um, It's like, what, what are we building towards and knowing that whatever you're doing is going to build towards the next thing. So do it well and do it with pride. Now you have a podcast and curiously, I don't know if you know this, but I'm pretty sure that one of your fonts on your podcast is called lobster. Did you know that? One of my fonts? Is? Yeah. The, the main font that that's written like the Sam Taylor podcast. I think that's lobster. Oh, well, that's exciting. <laughs> Anyways, Maybe, I don't know uh, if that was intentional. <laughs> no, it's, I, I'm going to ask her. So Anna, um, one of my co-authors for a case that just got accepted, um, Anna, former student and a guest to the podcast, she created the logo for me yeah. and maybe she remembered might, my, my lobster. It might not be lobster. It might not be, but lobster is a similar font. It might be, but um. Just for anybody who's now going back to the thumbnail, we're going through a brand redesign right now. So the font may or may not be lobster. So you'll have to go to a <laughs> previous uh, episode. That's hilarious though. Yeah, that would might, be really it, I'm pretty sure it's lobster. It might not be, but well, it if, looks like if lobster. If it's called sheep, then yeah. it is intentional because I did a whole like class um, about split off costs. 
Mm. And unfortunately, there were some there were some sheep harmed in it because you know you have the cost of the sheep, and then you have the lamb chops, and you have mm. the wool. Anyways, I'll leave it there. Um, <laughs> what's my transition out of this? I don't really know. Um, but I do want to know, because we have been talking about advice for management learners. Mm. What happens um, when you identify as a, as a professor or, or within your specific discipline? Let's see if I can weave there. Um, what happens with problems that you identify in your field? And kind of before, what, how do you tackle them? What are some specific problems within your field? Mm. What are some specific problems in my field? Yeah, I mean, problems within my sort of subfield, um, I guess this is one thing I could could get at, is like a very common one is like when you focus hard on a cognitively demanding task, um, can you measure that? And if that is measurable, uh, can you use that type of measurement to improve a system? Uh, so we do this, it's called cognitive load, cognitive overload. We use this a lot in information systems with EEG. Uh, so again, the, the brain imaging technologies. Um, you know, broader questions for information systems people, <laughs> they change every year, it seems, because the technology changes. But I, I think one of the, like a, a perfect example of a traditional IS question is technology adoption. Mm. Like what are the design features of a technology and what are the factors that make people, groups of people want to bring that technology uh, into their process. Um, so this question, you know, is probably the most influential question in IS because um, it was sort of articulated by this thing called the technology acceptance model that basically found, you know, if something's easy and something is seen as useful, people are more likely to actually adopt it surprise <laughs> it's funny because i was like I, as you were talking i was like i'm pretty sure he's talking about tam but i'm yep. not gonna stick I'm my talking like... about tam mm -hmm. <laughs> so when when fred i guess that was fred's phd thesis by the way Shut uh, up. yeah so fred fred's a funny guy if you ever get to meet him uh fred davis um so basically he wrote that and he's just like and the rest of his career is is about like i did this thing for my phd and it's like defined the discipline it's the most influential paper in the discipline and then uh, the rest of his career is just like, can I do something that's even deeper than Tam? Uh, oh. And I don't want to spill the beans on Fred, <laughs> but there's like kind of personal stuff there. And he's just like, you know, I want to know what goes on in the brain with Tam, which is why he did. He, I said there are 10 Nero IS groups. He's one yeah. of them. This is one of them at, um, at uh, Texas Tech in Lubbock, Texas. Okay. Uh, so he would cool. be one of those roughly 10 groups. Uh, would be Fred Davis's group, and he's one of the two or three that do a lot of work with um, with fMRI actually, rather than EEG. That's really yeah. that's cool because like I don't know, in like the whole self improvement like thing, it's like oh you know just just compete against yourself. It doesn't matter. It's not you against everybody. It's you against you. In this case, it's like man, maybe just like you know, <laughs> if you don't top yourself. It's good to like you know just know like. You have some success and that's a good problem to have. Like it doesn't need to be you against you. Wow. I can't imagine to like sit there and to have created something in your PhD and then have it just like pop off like that. That's amazing. And just see what happens next too. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think sometimes we underrate PhD research. Like not everyone's going to be the next world changer with the PhD, but a lot of the grunt work of research is done with PhD students. And it's also sometimes when people are at their most innovative because mm -hmm. there are only like two periods of time in your life. Well, maybe three, if you count sabbaticals uh, that a researcher will get to focus only on research. And so it's like PhDs and postdocs and then like your sabbatical. All other times you're doing teaching and yeah. universities revenue models are tied to teaching. So yeah. You think you're doing research, but you're probably not. They're going to care more about teaching, especially from now on. <laughs> um, by the way, that was another thing I called pretty early on. <laughs> and it's just like, hmm, better focus on teaching. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah not yeah, wrong. Yeah, and then, you know, um, and then sabbaticals. Because at the end of the day, at least in the public research universities, and maybe even to a lesser extent for nonprofits, you're a servant of the public. Yep. Um, Right. And not just, it, it, there's good things and bad things about yeah. that. You're not tied to their profit models uh, in a company, but at the same time, um, you are a public servant to an extent. 
which is yeah every your, all the salaries are public what there's a lot of accountability like just imagine like every email that you write is probably somewhere some, some looking by somebody and yeah, doing and something importantly the job is why universities are so dysfunctional in a way is because for professors a lot of the job is built around being self-motivated to do something mm. um, where there's like minimums that you have to do but the minimum bar is kind of low um, and then it's like then you just do what you want to do to exceed that and we assume everyone's going to do that at least sometime and yeah no um. <laughs> I, think, I think that's like one of the reasons why I'm pretty excited about um, the faculty restructuring and like you know I I have my moments where I like to pick on the bad things of everything, right? Because that's the auditor and me and the pessimist. But, you know, in general, when I look at this, I'm really excited because the people that I collaborate most with my research or talking or just, you know, that in, that I like to engage with when it's not, you know, it's always an application of, and it's been like yourself and Philippe and Janet and like all like the information systems people. So with the new structure, having, being able to have like cross appointments, joint appointments, having all these, having the new, you know, college, working towards the new college, having all these different opportunities for different people to possibly like engage with um, and seeing, seeing those research collaborations, I think being able to formalize it a bit better can really help that spirit of like, you know, being self-motivated and, or being in an environment in which helps spark that, you know, I don't want to say competition, but like that, that healthy, like, what do they call it? Um, help me out a little bit, but it's like, it's not you needing to sit in a corner and look at a, a screen. It's like, I want to do better because Colin's over there doing awesome things and Philippe's over there killing it. And it's like, okay, it's, it's almost like contagious, right? Yeah. I mean, when the university's working well why why we have research as part of our jobs and you know that's another whole other level of things we have instructors and the faculty people and uh, <laughs> uh, but what you know the research is like the whole idea of the university system even before industrial universities and industrial universities I'd say is like after World War II uh, the idea was that you'd get these like smart people who are doing weird stuff that isn't necessarily just useful uh, and get them together because they're experts and then get them to teach because people want to learn from them. Um, and then even in industrial universities, they try to do that, but at scale. Um, mm. And that scale didn't always really work. <laughs> and so we're dealing with the legacy of that today. Um, it's like we built these systems that, you know, where knowledge was once valuable, but I would actually argue that knowledge is actually a lot less valuable than it used to be because information is plentiful. Um, I think it's more important for people to develop character traits, actually, um, the ability to work well with information. Um, but yeah, so where we are today is like, we built the system where it's like, oh, people have PhDs, let's hire them, they must be smart, people will want to learn from them. Well, no, <laughs> not necessarily. No and now, yeah, and, and I think we're, you know, I'm not necessarily saying young professors are better. Um, it's more like we we created this this weird system um, that is going through a, a profound transformation even in yeah. Canada um, that will be good and bad. Um, there will be good things and bad things. I'm looking forward to finding out how we can mitigate the bad sides of that and enhance the good over the yeah. next decades. No, I I agree. And plus, I think that all the tenure and promotion documents uh, should have like a very big band around if you're born from like 1980 to 1992 <laughs> like you automatically get whatever you ask for that's that's what i think so <laughs> no. well let's see what happens <laughs> again um okay we've heard a lot about uh your work your research your likes your dislikes uh and we heard a little bit about jenny and some about argo and java but what else do you like to do for fun outside of work um perhaps some hobbies or like where can we find you when you're not uh in the fourth floor in your office oh dear <laughs> in the fourth floor in my office <laughs> where, where am i i'm usually at the fourth no. <laughs> um, yeah that's a tough one um no not necessarily i i feel like um if i may i'll just start yeah. it off a little bit you have um a famous dog park near you where you have a local <laughs> celebrity <laughs> Where you have a local celebrity, you mean Argo? No. Yes, Argo. Yeah, well, with all the Instagram followers. Sure. And like... Yeah, Argo does have Instagram followers. I'd say that Ar Argo, you know, is is the thing I'm most involved with. I also volunteer quite a bit with with other organizations. Um, but you know, 
I, I think like Argo is is definitely a, a big thing. In some ways, I haven't been exercising as much since I've gotten Argo because it's always like, hmm, this dog needs an hour walk. I better go do that. <laughs> And so I'm going to be looking forward to seeing how I can run with Argo instead. <laughs> that would be interesting. Or at least like partially little, run. <laughs> I put like a little harness on him and just, I don't know. That. Yeah, I think uh, that that's going to be like my project over the summer is not necessarily like getting him to run because I think I can run longer than he can because uh, he's a big dog, uh, but finding ways to be more active during during our walks mm. would be good. I like that. Sorry, he's also um, super just... social. He loves to see other dogs and humans. He's yeah. such a good patio dog. Like when we're out for drinks on the patio, like he's just like he's in his element. Yeah, I think once the weather gets better, you folks will probably see me uh, increasingly at um, the Oxford Tap Room because they they take dogs. Nice. Yeah, nice. I like it. I'm campus. looking forward to that. Yeah. Um. Do you want to do you want to share what organizations you volunteer with, or we can leave it at that? Yeah, just just a few around town. I, I've I don't know things have shifted a lot. I used to volunteer a lot with with the sort of public dialogue organization, and then um, Global Shapers is also another one that I used to do a lot of work with. Um, so that's a branch of the World Economic Forum. Gotcha. Okay, I love it. Um, and do you are you a big fan of like? fiction, nonfiction, um, basically uh, books outside of academic papers uh, or <laughs> listening to podcasts. Like, do not tell me your first, your five favorite academic papers, but uh, yeah. like, what Are you, you sure? Like <laughs> it's going to say, I, I have these stacks of books right behind me that are like all about nonfiction. <laughs> yeah, you, you can turn your camera. Like we're, we're just uh, like, you know, oh yeah. yeah, there's a big cheese there. We teach with cheese. See? We do. Nice. Um, but yeah, the, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I, people always say, assume that I'm better read than I am. <laughs> I don't do enough reading. <laughs> Too busy writing. <laughs> I, don't know. I like that um, that one book there. That um, oh gosh. Um, anyways, you recommended a book to me once. It was good. So if uh -oh. I remember it, I'll put it into the show notes. But uh, it was almost like an um, a very accessible research methods with. Um, Oh my gosh. Um, anyways. Yeah. What, scientists. What, what, oh, hmm? uh, I forgot. Uh, I'll, I'll really... recommend a book to the, to the listeners anyways, yeah. though, if you're interested in like really sort of philosophy type math stuff, but want a book that's more accessible. Um, I really liked the book of why. That's uh, the one I'm trying to talk about. Oh, that's Thank the book you. you're trying to talk about. Thank okay. you. This one right here. <laughs> So I, yeah, I, I think Bo Yu still has my copy. And it's been like five <laughs> years and I want it back. Uh, but you know, Bo the Book Yu, of Why by Judea Pearl. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so Bo, better give my Book of Why back someday or else I'm just going to have to buy a new copy and bill it to him. <laughs> no. uh, but I, I think that that, um, that is a pretty good book. Because, um, you know, one, one of the things people are talking about artificial intelligence and we, we just got chat GPT, right? Which is super interesting. Um, one of the limitations of deep learning AI, the AI we had that was really popular until this type of stuff with chat GPT, uh, is that it's really not great at reasoning causally. Mm. It's great at pattern recognitions, but not really causal reasoning. And this is something that humans are good at. We like create models of stuff that have explanatory power and we test them and we go out and look in the world and try to improve our models, right? So Judea Pearl is an expert in that topic of causal reasoning, sort of. And he writes in a more accessible way because the way that he normally writes is like arcane statistics. Very hard to read. Uh, don't read the book called Causality. If you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> don't do that. This is probably not the book for you. Yeah. Uh, but the book of why is definitely the right. book for you. <laughs> um, and that that's a good book for understanding, you know, this type of limitations of AI in a way that they can be improved mind you if we end up with causal ai then i think i think we're done i think that that will be the final ai that's like the last major hurdle but now when you mean the last ai and that we're done do you mean that like humans are are gone or no no like... i mean it's essentially similar to human thought okay at that stage like um and they're not just going to be like humans you just talk to them like we are though you could in theory build those too uh, but 
it's sort of like the last major frontier of mm. of um of of inductive reasoning really mm. and if you can get machines that can do that you can do a lot uh, so the generative algorithm stuff with chat gpt is actually a significant advancement i think it's a little overhyped it's like mega hyped right now <laughs> but i i think like creativity was always pointed at as the sort of thing that you know ai doesn't do well but for people who've been studying ai it's just like uh, uh not so sure <laughs> and then chat gpt3 actually was was big on, in the academic community and then chat gpt became really popular which is more like gpt 3.5 mm. um so create but no one's surprised really um of people who are familiar with ai about i was chat gonna say GPT. people that are familiar with ai yeah but the causal reasoning will be the last frontier Okay. Um, the last major hurdle that AI systems have before they really work like humans. Yeah, well, I'm excited to uh, to reread uh, the book of why. I'm glad we nailed that down. And also just to, I think accessible is really important. I was talking with my friend today about taxes and it goes back to personal finances. And um, they were getting, you know, a little bit stressed about different things. We we're just talking about concepts or like just in theory where to put things because there's rules against what accountants can and cannot do um, if you're not licensed to do that. But just the questions that they were asking, um, it really highlights to me the level of uh, the level of inequality when it comes to uh, information that really relates to people's uh, you know, their lives really. And the amount of like impact um, that this lack of lack of knowledge, meaning it's not that they weren't knowledgeable. It's just that the systems in place are more difficult than they perhaps need to be. And they end up being uh, holding people back and really not having that accessibility. Are you laughing? Cause this um, brings back to your. Uh... Oh, philosophy is really bad for this. <laughs> That's why I'm thinking. Yeah. Like, you know, um, I have a, one, one of my best friends is always like, yeah. And he's really interested in philosophy, actually. But he's like, the words you use are needlessly pretentious. It's like, who cares? Yeah. Just explain that thing. <laughs> that rather than use this word that like summarizes a book. It's like Davidsonian or yeah. Kantian ethics. It's like, well, what is Kantian? Just like explain that. It's actually not that complicated. Uh, usually when you say it in the context of Kantian ethics, it's like this This is a sort of reasoning around sort of rules that everyone has to have in order to be a rational human being. Uh, oh, I, that was such a meta example that you brought out with Kantian ethics, right? Well, I, I mean, that that's a good example. It's yeah. like you just name drop this thing and it's like, well, if you've ever read Kant, don't. <laughs> you hate yourself. <laughs> no one reads Kant. You it's kind of like the tax act, Kant. yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. Like, don't read Kant. Read yeah. people who wrote about Kant. And even then, like, you know, drop, dropping this name bomb is needless in that context. Yeah, and it really just takes out the accessibility. And I don't know, um, I feel like just, you know, coming in, I'm going to have a couple more wrap up questions for you, uh, including the one that some people love or don't love. But one thing that really is an aim of my podcast here and why I'm doing this is because, you know, I didn't know people who went to university until I went to university and was around people that went to university. And um, the accessibility and the feelings of, can I do this? Should I be here? What does this look like? Um, there really doesn't need to be as big of a gap, if any, between um, where we are and what we think we can become or you know, trying. So if anything, I love that somebody, you know, like I, I respect you so much as a professional and an academic and as a friend. And it's like, you know, you can be somebody who does really cool scientific brain stuff and then shoots the shit with their dog on a patio in a summer. And it's like, you know, this is the human, this is the, you know, we're all, and we're accessible. Like I'm at the end, I'm going to ask you if I can put up your Dal email, you know, and mm -hmm. I I'm thinking that might be okay, but it's like, yeah. we're, we are, we're more alike than we're not alike. So people should, you know, go for what they want and not hold themselves back is my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you asked me for books now, now <laughs> I'm going to be anti-pretentious by being pretentious. No. <laughs> Love it. Go for uh, it. Another book that I think is kind of interesting is, um, the Tyranny of Merit by Michael Sandel. Um, so I'm not going to summarize everything that he says in this book, but basically one of the things he says that I found quite interesting is that credentialism, which is this idea that 
because someone has a piece of paper behind their name is one of the last legal forms of discrimination and one that's even encouraged in our society. Not so wrong. having a degree is very important in a lot of ways, even though somebody might know the things or might have the traits of somebody who has a degree without having the degree. Uh, and so we discriminate against people a lot based on these things. Uh, and this is kind of a problem. I think it's less of a problem in Canada as in the United States, but it's still a problem in Canada. Um, and it can be very divisive in society. Um, so rethinking like, you, you know, psychologists call this socioeconomic status, right? Mm. Uh, which you could have people who are high income, but not as educated. And maybe they are higher socioeconomic status, maybe, but it kind of creates differences as well in their groups. Um, you know, um, so, but this idea that education can separate you, I think is, is a legal form of discrimination in a way. Fair. One that's even endorsed by our society. We're not wrong. Ooh, I like this. Uh, leaving with some, some really big stuff. thoughts to think about. No, I love <laughs> it. It's great. Right. Full circle philosophy. Made, <laughs> major. Yeah. That's the, that's the only book I've read like all year. Is no, don't say that. Tyranny of Ram Merit. Actually, it is. It's the only <laughs> book. Everything else I've done is like writing <laughs> and rereading old stuff and just like writing stuff, writing something that I read 12 years ago. Uh, it's like, oh, no, I remember reading this book. I'm going <laughs> to give new commentary on this book that I read 12 years ago. Hey, sometimes <laughs> you say like the, the classics are classic for a reason, right? Or it's good to come back because you'll have a, you know, new, new frame, new 12 years worth of experiences to apply. Yeah. Um, okay, Colin, I, you're not going to get out this easy. Um, I'm really curious. What is your definition of success? <laughs> success. <laughs> what is my definition of success? Some sort of income. No. <laughs> <laughs> Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, no, hey, that you're might okay be it. That. It's like making <laughs> enough money so I don't have to think about making any money. <laughs> no, I, it depends on what you mean by success. Um, you know, for so success in general or success for me? What is your definition? So if your definition includes making a definition before you build on it, um, however you want to take this. Yeah. So success is having the capability or be, being in a state that you can have the capabilities to do the things that you, that you want to do that define who you are. Um, so for some people, they don't need a lot of money, but some people do. And needs are broadly construed. Like somebody might have physical needs. Maybe they have kids. I don't know. So you need more money. That's a reality. Uh, maybe you need more money because you have health needs. I don't know. I just made this up. No, nope, uh, but I... every, everyone is different, really. The amount of money that you make depends on what your needs are and what you want to do with your life. Because sometimes people will have very passionate things that they want to do with their lives. And sometimes those are good reasons and sometimes they're not, um, but that is success. Uh, for me personally, it's different. Uh, I, um, I once wanted to be an entrepreneur and I still do, but differently than what I want it to be. Um, mm. Why I am a professor is because I thought to myself, even if I was really successful, even if I had a startup exit and I made $10 million, even in the event of an exit, I'd probably do something pretty similar to what I'm doing right now. So why don't I just go and do that instead? And that's why I took this job rather than made a startup. I am still probably going to make a startup someday. It's not going to be the sort of thing where I can't do my job as well. And so I'm probably never going to seek venture in capital, really, knock on wood. Love it. I said it here first, yeah. but that doesn't mean I won't start a company that does something. And that actually gives you a lot more freedom, by the way, if you don't have ties to VC, you can Absolutely. do a lot more. They're smaller markets, but they are um, still valid markets, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's um, two things uh, just on the VC one. Yeah. Like basically if you're an entrepreneur, a founder and you get VC, you just bought yourself a boss or you got, you know, you just got yourself a boss. Um Yep. And now, yeah, so it's almost like, you know, not bad, not good, just different. It's a choice. So if yeah. you're able to not, not if, have to go if there. If you want to make a lot of money, you should do VC. If you're, if you're a founder who wants to make a lot of money, if the most important thing for you is, is 
is becoming a capitalist, like somebody who has over $2 million in assets. That's kind of what I'd call a capitalist. Uh, you should definitely go with the VC. Yeah. So Shark Tank, Shark Tank model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, if that's not your goal, then don't do that. <laughs> fair. Um, you're, what you said though, um, I'm going to probably butcher it, but it reminds me of this, the story. It's like millionaire, bazillionaire pops off his yacht, her yacht, their yacht uh, onto the pier. And they're walking along to like the fancy stores and they come across a fisherman and a fisher person. And they're like, hey, like, uh, what you doing? And they get to talking to the person fishing and the person fishing's like, oh, like I'm fishing for my family. And he's like, oh, like how, like how much are you getting? He's like, oh, just enough to like feed them for the day. And he's like, well, like how long does that take you? And he's like, oh, a couple hours, hour or two, like just depends when the fish comes. And then the bazillionaire is just like talking. Have you heard this? Mm -mm. Okay. There's like talking and he's like, oh, like, well, what if you got like, you know, if you stayed here for like eight to 10 hours and got more fish and then sold the fish and then, you know, got employees and you could get more fish and sell more fish. And, and the fisherman's like, okay, like go on. Like, what else would I do? He's like, well, then eventually you would go to other peers and you would hire more employees and then you'd hire people to manage those employees. And then he's like, okay, go on. He's like, yeah. And the bazillionaire is like, yeah, I can invest in you. And it goes on and on and on. And the fisherman's like, okay, well then what do I do? He's like, well, eventually you're going to have uh, <laughs> so much money uh, that, you know, you can buy a boat, your own boat, maybe even a, a yacht like mine. And the fisherman's like, okay, then what would I do? And the bazillionaire's like, well, you can do whatever you want then. And the fisherman's like, yeah, kind of like what I'm doing right now, <laughs> you know? So it's like, I, I love it. It's we oftentimes, myself at least, um, and one of, one of the reasons for this podcast is like, what, like, what are the options? What are the points? And what are, what are the end goals that are possible? Because what is very possible is that somebody is living their best life right now or their best life with a tweak or two in mindset or an opportunity that's like, even with all the money in the world, you know, you still want to do some stuff and you still want to do some things. So what are those things? And what does that day look like? And maybe that's things that are bringing in income and maybe they're not, but like just income doesn't equal bad or work necessarily. Just like no income doesn't necessarily mean good and purposeful. It's finding out what do you want and going back to your definition, of the broader definition of success and recognizing it relatively early on that you might just be in that, um, except for the paperwork. So I think you're going to have to find an AI to figure out how to do your paperwork. I'm working on that actually. So one of my hopes at the college is that we'll have enough money to hire someone to do the paperwork. I love it. I at very least it. the computer scientists are, are on board with that idea <laughs> that's how I'm going to get them actually yeah. I think and as a management person you're like I I assign you to go do that yeah. no I think like so my my theory with this is like you know it, it doesn't take a ton of money but it will take some but once you have like seventy thousand dollars a year or maybe a bit more maybe like 80 because somebody needs benefits uh, and then you, you hire this person to be your main grants facilitator mm. and they manage all the my tax grants which is the biggest pain in my ass <laughs> like all of that paperwork all of like the pre-grant writing like the professors will still need to write the grants but they'll help you prepare for that and like we have somebody just dedicated to that task and that that would make things so much better and it's again virtuous snowball because once you have that all of a sudden you can apply for more grants <laughs> and yeah <laughs> I love it. Um, well, if somebody wants to pre-apply for that job or if somebody just wants to talk to you in general, maybe ask you um, how much it costs to feed a dog that's 130 pounds or uh, they want to know a bit more about you or your story, uh, I'm going to link to uh, the your DAO website if that's okay. Yeah, it'd be a pleasure. And they can email me at just colin.conrad at dell.ca. Perfect. Um, Thank anyone you. can email me at any time. I'll usually respond if you're a Dell student or a student in general. If you are with like Elsevier asking me to publish in their journals, though, I'll tell you to get that. You can edit that part out if you want. No, no, no. We are we are keeping that in. Uh, I like you said get bent, and earlier I told somebody to fuck off. So like okay. that, that that pretty much summarizes. Uh, well, you like, said this twice now. You said the F word twice. Now we're out of PG thirteen. Oh, well. oh no well i never keep in there or I'm pg sorry. pg pg is the one where you can you can do the f-bomb exactly once i think exactly once. i like yeah. that yeah that's right, that's I'll... pg <laughs>
<laughs> oh man, I, it's funny because I do click the adult content part, and part of me is like, I, it feels very like it feels very naughty to like click the adult part, but I'm like, whatever. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> it contains adult content. I'm like, it's oh, whatever. Um, I just don't want to put kids to sleep. I guess. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, thank you, Colin. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate you being here. It's a pleasure and an honor. Thanks for thinking of me. Take care. Bye, Sam. I'm going to have to edit this part out now because now I can't find my stop recording. (laughs) Hey again. Thank you for watching the whole episode. If you did like the episode, don't forget to like, share and subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified for future uploads. Also, if you would like to listen to these podcasts on your way to work or school, don't forget to check Sam's Spotify at the Sam Taylor podcast.